Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. I think it's really important for people to be their own advocates. And when this all first started for me, there was not a headache specialist in the Atlanta area, but I found a neurologist who I call a team doctor. She listens to me. I can bring her things and we talk it through. Hello, and welcome to Talking Head Pain, the podcast that confronts head pain head on. Hi, I'm Joe Co, Director of Education Digital Strategy at the Global Healthy Living Foundation and a migraine patient for over 20 years. I'm here with Susan McManus, who is a migraine advocate that I connected with at Headache on the Hill. Susan has been attending the Alliance for Headache Disorders Advocacy, Headache on the Hill, since 2020, both in person and virtually. But it was a good opportunity to connect with Susan and learn why she became an advocate and the important work that she does. Hi, Susan. How are you today? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Thank you for having me. So let's start with talking about migraine and what your worst migraine attack is like. Can you explain it to our audience very quickly? I think what most people do not understand is that it's not just a headache. It's a full body experience. So there may be a migraine I have where the head pain isn't you know, too bad, but the fatigue is just overwhelming. And so I'm not going to get out of the chair. And I think also people don't understand the difference between fatigue and being tired. And I I tell people being tired is being tired. Having fatigue is I am melted into my chair. My chair has consumed me. (laughs) So that can sometimes be my worst. I've heard people talk about fatigue, feeling like you're walking through jello or that there's a force pulling you down when you're trying to just function. So yeah, there is a big difference between being tired and and having fatigue. Yeah, that's a good analogy as well. You um, have had migraine for how long, Susan? I was diagnosed a little over 20 years ago. I do think that teenage Susan had it as well as my dad. And we would just say we had a killer sinus headache. And we had just recently moved to Georgia. So I think that it was also our bodies adapting to the different pollens and things like that. But I don't know for sure. I wish I could go back. I was probably having menstrual migraines. You know, now that I look back on it. So I officially got diagnosed a little over 20 years ago. And then I call myself a very highly functioning migraineur because I had kids in school. I was on the you know PTA boards, booster clubs, very involved. I substituted, you know, if I hadn't been coming on, I take my medicine two hours later, I'd feel fine, go about my day. And then a little over a dozen years ago, I turned chronic and that's when life kind of halted. And did your family understand that shift? From episodic to chronic? That's interesting. So when it happened, my oldest daughter was away at college and my youngest one was in high school. So I'm so grateful I didn't have small children while I was dealing with the the beginnings of the chronic part. So I will say that my daughter being away at college didn't get it as much because she just didn't see it. She wasn't here. Whereas my husband and my younger daughter were still living here. But my husband, he's the one that can really tell. Like if I go on a like a girl's trip, let's say, and I'll send him pictures, he'll text me. He's like, do you have a migraine? Yeah. How did you know? He goes, I can tell in your eyes. That's a spousal thing. He has been my rock. And I do have a very, very strong family support system. And then you got involved in advocacy. How did you find out about Headache on the Hill? And what brought you to lending your voice in that way? So it actually goes back a little bit further. I think it was around 2016. I started volunteering with uh, the Migraine World Summit, which led to then also volunteering with migraineagain.com. And I did that for a few years. And then it dawned on me, one thing I kept telling myself is I don't want to think about migraine 24-7. Well, when you're doing a volunteer job that is all about migraine, that's all you're doing. And I I thought I I had to pull myself back from that because it was just a little bit much. But that's how I then found out about Headache on the Hill. And my first Headache on the Hill in 2020 was in person. And I got to meet a lot of the people that I worked with on the World Summit who are from all over the world, but the ones that lived in other places in the country. My roommate was from California. You know, so we'd known each other for a couple of years, but it never actually met. And that was a lot of fun. We had a dinner one night. 
I miss those connections, although I've stayed um, in touch with a number of those people. It just was better for me to not think about it every day. So Headache on the Hill is great in that it's just once a year, you know, we, we put in, you know, our training, you know, so the whole thing is only a couple of weeks. It, it's not a huge time commitment, but it keeps my hand in the advocate pot, so to speak, and and makes me feel like I'm still doing something good. I, and I also do miles for migraine, which is you know also a part of Headache on the Hill. They sponsor each other. That's amazing. And a small plug for Migraine World Summit this year. I'm one of the speakers. Oh, congrats. It starts next week. It does. Well, it might not be next week for the viewers or the listeners. But you could find it at MigraineWorldSummit.com, I believe. A really, really interesting program. And Carl and and Paula are good friends and have been amazing advocates in this work. So I'm not surprised that you've connected with some good folks through your journeys. There was something that you spoke about, which I thought was really interesting. And we don't hear it a lot from advocates. You talked about how you don't want to think about migraine or your chronic disease 24-7. And I think that's a really interesting perspective to share. Can you talk about why you don't want to think about your disease all the time? I actually have have done a few therapy sessions. And one thing the therapist had me do, because I just felt like I was having migraine, you know, day after day after day. And she said, you know, each day, just journal, like, you don't have to go in. I'm I'm not a writer, like, don't go into writing all about, but just sort of take note of, oh, well, the morning was good. And I was good at lunch. But around 2pm, I got hit with a migraine. So the late afternoon, early evening, they weren't so great. And that helped me realize that even though like, we have to call that a migraine day for medical purposes, my entire day was not actually a migraine. I had some good hours. And so that's kind of started the thought process of, yeah, I don't want to think of, and I don't do the journaling anymore because it's just, I, I, I know now, you know, I'm not in a migraine all 24 hours of the day. Sometimes I am, but sometimes I'm not. And so I don't usually do New Year's resolutions, but this year I decided I need to get out of the house more. I am a very outgoing person. I play tennis. We have a pretty big tennis league here in Atlanta that's getting ready to start back up. So that'll help get me out of the house. But I miss people. And so I thought, I'm going to try something this year. And I'm just going to pretend I don't have migraine. And I'm going to try to get out of the house and do something every day. And how has that been going? Have you done anything very different than you might not have done? I've got done a little shopping where I would have normally have done that online. But then yesterday I had decided, oh, let's do this, this and this. And I actually was supposed to go to tennis practice around 930 and it was a pretty day and I was excited about that. But I woke up about 530 and I was in so much pain, texted a couple of my girlfriends and said, I don't think I'm going to be there. (laughs) So, you know, I'm I'm trying to put a positive spin on it and do what I can. So uh, I can't really tell you right now. (laughs) It's, It's still early in the process. And I think that's important that we look to live the life that we want to live, but also know that it's okay if we can't and that that's not failing, but we're working toward engaging in the world in the manner in which we want to. So I I think it's interesting. I don't think we talk enough about that concept in patient advocacy. And it's hard if you are, you know, chronic or if you have symptoms 24-7 or if you are like high disease burden to say, I'm going to not think about it because how can you not? But there are many of us that can not dwell on some of the negatives and what might that look like and how might that feel? I think those are really interesting questions to ask ourselves. How does that contribute to our ability to continue to advocate so we don't engage in or have burnout? Yeah, I personally was having an issue with what is my purpose? Sort of, I was a stay-at-home mom, which I love, but I was like I said, very involved with school and two both girls played every sport there is and um, substituting. So we were always on the go. And then when my youngest went to college, an opportunity came up to work for my brother part time, but out of my home. And I really enjoyed that because I was like, what am I going to do now? You know, I don't have any more school volunteering in this. That was my job. So I worked for him part time for about four years until I just got to the point where I was working in 15 minute increments, like in my pajamas. And I was barely getting by and I just I just couldn't do it anymore. 
I think I would probably qualify for disability, but that's not something I pursued. But I cannot hold down a regular job, um, which I would like to have something to do part time. But then, ten, like I said, tennis is coming up and then I don't want a job interfering <laughs> again to get outside and play my tennis. I wouldn't either. Let the people play tennis. So is there anything that I didn't ask that you would want to share? I just think it's really important for people to be their own advocates. And when this all first started for me, there was not a headache specialist in the Atlanta area. But I found a neurologist who I call a team doctor. She listens to me. I can bring her things and we talk it through. I was her first patient to try, you know, all the, the different CGRPs that have come out over the years, um, the injectables, the pills, whatever. And she was so excited. Then I also have, I don't think it's very common. I have an ENT who is also has a dental degree and he has really helped in find what I like to call my puzzle pieces. So along the, the way, I got diagnosed with sleep apnea. And I needed to have neck surgery. Like, and so we find these things that have made my life better. But him being both an ENT and having that dental knowledge, I went to him because I thought I had a sinus infection. And he said, I hate to tell you this, but you're having a cluster headache. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. I'm already chronic. Now you're going to put cluster? Well, it ended up it was a bad tooth, but a tooth on the bottom but the pain was up below my eye because you never know where the nerves are going to shoot the pain. And uh, he's the one that found that, my ENT. So the two of them, and they know each other and they communicate with each other. They, Like I said, I've created a team of doctors and they listen to me and will try things or say, mm, yeah, we're not doing that. <laughs> you know, if I bring them something a little bit out of the ordinary so it, that's so important because I think a lot of doctors don't listen to the patient. And that's exhausting being your own advocate. Well, thank you. You've shared some really insightful pieces of information that I know the folks that listen to this podcast and read our transcripts will find to be valuable. I appreciate your energy, Susan, and all that you do to make people feel better. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Talking Head Pain, the podcast that confronts head pain head on. If you like this episode, please give it an honest five-star rating and subscribe so you never miss another one. I'm Joe Co, and I will see you next time. Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. 